that I should self-support, that I was un-Australian, that I was a disgrace. I got death threats. I had radio commentators saying that they would like to run me over. Racist posters were put up around the city. I lost work. I had to move house. And when I eventually decided that I would leave the country, a national TV station ran a poll asking whether I should leave or stay to face my kids. Here's the thing. Outrage happens all the time, but this was no ordinary outrage. It didn't go for a day, or a week, or even a month. And this wasn't just social media, or mainstream media, or the government, or the public. This was over 130,000 words in hundreds of articles. And it went for four months, almost daily. This was no ordinary outrage. This. Oh, pardon me. Right, technology. Yo, guys, nice to see everyone. I'm just getting the technology ready. Here we go. Right, we're good. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Yo, nice to see everybody. Good to see a good turnout again for the third Caravan Sarai. Um, I'm super excited today because we've got some really amazing guests. Today is a really good friend of mine, and I feel super blessed to have her. More about her in a sec. Just to kind of let you guys know, Caravan Sarai um, is a, a meeting place. And the idea is that we're all going on our interesting diasporic journeys, and we wanted to create a digital space, which hopefully could turn into a real space one day. But how can we create uh, a junction, a station that we're all kind of coming together on and sharing learnings about our own journeys so it might benefit other people? Um, we really wanted to start this because, you know, a lot of these interesting and amazing conversations, they happen in ivory towers and they happen in places that are really secluded and detached from a lot of people who don't have the luxury of tapping into that resource. So how can we democratize the spreading of really interesting ideas, ideas that benefits us in our own life. Um, this is an attempt, attempt at providing this platform and these ideas and these perspectives, and especially these people who at times we might be inaccessible for a lot of people. How can we have these conversations in a really public way to benefit as many people as possible? Um, I'm very glad you're here. It's good to see everyone. It's a gloomy day outside. It's a bit gray and grim. So uh, it's, it's good to know that you couldn't be anywhere else or you wouldn't prefer to be anywhere else. Um, let's get started because we've got lots to get through. I want to introduce firstly my co-host for today is the amazing, incredible uh, man of many talents. He's a carpenter by day, but he's a runner by night. Uh, my boy Ali. Ali, can you introduce yourself and say hi to everybody, please? Wow, I'm talking and I'm muted. But hey everyone, thank you for that amazing introduction. Now they are too kind. Uh, yes, Lena, I'm so happy to excited to speak to you. So happy to see you here. Um, yeah, tonight's show is going to be great. Um, full of wisdom, full of knowledge, full of jokes. And I can't wait. So yeah, let's go. Let's get into it. Right. Now, also, I want to introduce you to someone who uh, is an integral part of this. It's, her name is Hanan. A lot of you know her really well. She's going to be taking questions at the end, and she's going to be giving a rounded conclusion of everything we've talked about. Hanan, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi everyone. Hi Yasmin. Uh, it's me, Hanan. I'm excited to hear what you're going to be sharing with us today, Yasmin. I've heard only good things, amazing things, lots of stories about you. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to learn from you today. Thanks, Hannah. Now, last but not least is, oh God. Okay, so I don't want to, she gets introduced on a lot of platforms because, you know, martial arts girls have spoken on some amazing stages. So I don't want to give you the kind of professional lowdown. You can Google that. But what I will give you is the personal account of someone who I've come to rely on, not only as like a creative muse, but a confidant and someone who I kind of feel like we're living very similar lives in tandem. And she's someone I can relate to on a really deep and emotional level. So I'm really grateful to have her here because I think so many people could benefit from her wisdom as I do. She's, uh, I don't know whether she'll like me saying this, she's a serial overachiever. She is someone who literally, when she touches something, it literally turns to gold there is no horizon no mountain that is beyond her reach um and we're going to kind of break down some of the milestones that she's totally demolished throughout her life 
Um, and I'm really looking forward to kind of her um, introducing herself. Uh, Yasmin, are you there? Hey, wow. Masha'Allah, 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 Masha'Allah. Yeah, 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 girl, <laughs> looking fabulous as always. <laughs> oh my goodness. I am so humbled and grateful and all the good things to be here. Um, uh -huh. I actually remember, I remember when Nadir said to me, like, this must have been over a year ago now. He's like, I've got this idea for this run club. We're going to call it Benny. And I was like, yeah, cool, dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> never underestimate the vision. Never <laughs> underestimate the vision. And here I am on your platform. MashaAllah, you've brought some amazing people together. You've Thanks, facilitated some incredible conversations. And Thank I'm you. just as, um, I feel just as sort of like, I enjoy your journey um, as somebody sort of moving alongside you just as much, I think, if not more. Thanks, girl. It means a lot to me. And a lot of that is thanks to all the kind of agony aunt you've played over my life. <laughs> she gets the brunt of my like, oh man, I'm just really frustrated with life. But you know, we have a common connection. You know, the person who introduced me to Ali was you. Yeah. Yes. No, I, feel the same. I go to Yasmin with all my problems. I'm like, Yasmin, how did you deal with this when you were this? <laughs> how did you get your parents to allow you to do this? It's like, Yasmin is like my big sister in my life. I go Aww. to <laughs> yeah but she's like low-key angry at me because now we're better friends than, than you two are <laughs> yeah it's kind of like, it's kind of this is the problem when you have like cool people in your life and you introduce them to each other and then all of a sudden they're hanging out without you and it's like <laughs> hold on this was not how it was supposed to go <laughs> you know what i thought i thought you introduced me to him because um because you wanted me to be a good influence on him. Actually, I, I, la I later found out it's because she wanted Ali to be a good influence on me. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So look, let's jump in it. There's lots to get through. Um, Yasmin, yeah. let's start with the beginning. Where are you from? Uh, where did you spend your early life? Uh, what do you associate as being the place that shaped you? Mm. Thank you. It's it's always interesting being asked where you're from, right? And I think it, de depending on who's asking me, I'll I'll change right. the answer to that. Um, but from a facts-based point of view, I was born in Sudan to parents of sort of mixed Sudanese heritage. If you if you sort of like did one of those 23andMe tests, you'd find that you know we had a bit of Egyptian, a bit of Turkish, a bit of Moroccan, a bit of whatever. But ultimately, we're Sudanese because that is what modern Sudan is. It's an amalgamation of all these different things. My family moved to Australia when I was a year and a half. And we were the second, we were essentially the second Sudanese family in Brisbane. Um, and the next Sudanese family didn't come to like 10 years later. So when I say I grew up in a really white environment, like I remember when I moved to, I moved to London two and a half years ago, um, when I got on the tube from Heathrow station and I like saw a couple of cool looking black women on the tube with me I just started smiling at them because I was like oh my god there are other black people here too this is great <laughs> like <laughs> the one that I grew up in was so different um I didn't know it was different though because it was my normal so I grew up in Brisbane went to a Muslim primary school um which was like I think a really good grounding because I I had a I had a kind of surety in my faith from from the fact that everyone around me was also Muslim and so that, alhamdulillah, was never anything that I questioned along the way. Yeah. Um, and then I went to a Christian ecumenical high school. I was the first girl to wear the hijab um, just after 9-11, good times. Um, and then I graduated, I went and did mechanical engineering because I loved um, race cars. Uh, and we'll get to all that, but I worked on oil and gas rigs for four years. Yeah, moved we'll down to a few different cities and yeah. now I'm in London. But like... Okay, so can, can, I, can I, you're saying, you're saying, okay, yeah, there's a lot to like write down there, but you're saying, you're telling me that like, you actually felt like a quite a grounded sense of your own spirituality as a result of your environment that wasn't particularly diverse? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I think what my parents did really well, and it's something mm -hmm. that I'm only recognizing in hindsight, is that they, they said, in this house, we're Muslim. And in this house, this is how things are done. And this is a safe space for us. Out there, there's other people, they do whatever they want and that's fine and that's up to them, but we're not the other people. And maybe that wasn't like the most, you know, inclusive way to go about bringing up children, but they had just like escaped a coup in Sudan and they were trying to do the best. And they never said those other people are lesser or those yeah. other people are better. It was just like, those other people are different and they do things differently. And so I guess like 
alhamdulillah, I look back and I think, oh, well, being in an environment that where I, I think I was also, to be honest, I think I was also really lucky because our community was super small. There were only a few hundred families in all of Brisbane. So we knew all of the Muslims, literally. And it meant that like, we could kind of shape what the Muslim community looked like. Like my dad helped build the mosque. Well, the mosque was burnt down actually after 9-11 because lol. Um, but my, my, my dad helped rebuild that mosque. Um, you know, so like, but it was a small enough community that we actually kind of shaped it. And the way that we lived kind of set set the trend for the communities that are coming after. That's crazy. Cause like a lot of the time, like there's, there's two ways that can play out, right? From my experience anyway, is that when you kind of grow up in quite a homogenous environment, it can either, it can either make you feel like a need to assimilate and yeah. become like the environment around you, or it can do the exact opposite. It can actually make you feel more emboldened in who you are and you claim your difference. Like, like I like to think like, I never feel, um, how do I word this? I never feel more Muslim then I'm more, then when I'm in non-Muslim environments. Oh, totally. But yeah, then I never I feel it. like as Muslim when I'm in all Muslim environments. Yeah, well, because it's like, what are you comparing yourself to, right? And right. I also think like, it's, it's important not to, like, it wasn't all roses, right? Like there were definitely some things like, for example, my, my, my conception of what was beautiful and what was desirable was very warped by, by my kind of, the, the very white homogenous world that I grew up in. Yeah. Or the fact that like, you know, the way that my family operated is very different to everybody else's. And so I guess I felt a very strong sense of who I was, but I didn't know whether who I was, was valued in the world. Mm. And those are slightly different things. How did that manifest? Did that manifest through your education or what you decided to study? Was there yeah. always like a need to kind of prove yourself? You know, it's funny because I don't ever think I would have said that I was proving myself, but I obviously had a point to prove. Like, why would I constantly put myself in situations where no other Muslim people were or no other women were, right? Like, right. Like, so like, like a, con some context, level. mechanical engineering. Okay, That's so like, like, you couldn't pick, like, pick a harder degree. You couldn't pick a more male dominated degree. Listen, there were seven girls out of 300 guys in my, so firstly, in my like main two subjects in high school, like my A-levels, I was the only girl. Um, and there were seven girls and 300 guys in my mechanical engineering class first class honors what and then I was the first girl to I was the first woman hired in my engineering department in Australia when I got hired so for the majority of my like engineering life I didn't work with other women and yeah. de definitely not like young black Muslim women and so yeah. I think at some level the way that I went through myself oh, sorry the way that I went through the world was thinking well I'm not going to be accepted for like the traditional reasons that people might accept somebody because they look some way or because they dress some way because of whatever. So I have to find other ways to find belonging. And it wasn't necessarily by proving myself, but funnily enough, I found more belonging on an oil rig than sometimes in the ladies area in the mosque. Wow. What, 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 what does that mean? Like how? What? <laughs> well, because, because I was so different, right? I could present myself, like say I walk onto an oil rig and they're like, you do not belong here. But I say to them, I actually feel like I do belong here. And, and if I make a convincing enough argument for it, they'll be like, oh, okay, fine, whatever, like get involved. But if I go into the ladies like area in the mosque, for example, there are all these rules for how you, someone like me should belong in that environment. But there are right. no rules for how someone like me should belong on an oil rig or in a race car team. Yeah. Right, because it, that precedent has not been set before. So because I was the first in so many places, I could set my own rules. I could set yeah. how things were. So now there are, funnily enough, almost all the young Sudanese girls in Queensland, where I grew up, are doing engineering. And a bunch of them work wow. in, in like engineering fields because I was the first Sudanese girl to like go through university in Brisbane and I did engineering. So all of them are like, yeah. oh, cool. That's what we do now. That's insane to have inspired that many people. And then like straight after engineering, you did what? Right, so um, I'm gonna have to go into a little bit of story time. So I um, started, when I, was, when I was working on the rigs, uh, you know, on land and offshore oil rigs, writing a little blog about my time in, you know, on the rigs called Crazy Rig Conversations. Somebody approached me and said, hey, would you like to write a book about your life? And I was like, no, lols, I'm an engineer. I don't write. And my mom, <laughs> My mom was like, excuse me, yes, take the book deal. 
Wow, go like, mom, I'm God. I pay you money. I was like, okay, moms, whatever. So I take this book deal and I'm like, okay, let's give this a shot. Write the story and end up writing the story mostly the way that I kind of made it work in my head was I was like, I'm going to write this for all the women that don't get to write their own stories, right? All the Sudanese diaspora, et cetera. Write this book. My oil company, I tell them that I'm writing a book. Um, but they're not super excited about it. And then when I publish the book, they're like, mm -mm -mm. now let me set the context for you. I was the top ranked drilling graduate in my region, in the whole of Asia Pacific. I had yeah. just gotten a double promotion to run my own rig offshore Brunei, right? I was, just, I was literally three days away from flying to run my own rig, right? Yeah. I get a message from one of the heads um, of the company in my area and they were like, uh, we're pulling you in we're actually going to issue you a disciplinary warning because you publishing this book demonstrates a pattern of behavior of non-compliance. We're going to dock your pay. We're going to dock your promotion. Uh, oh. We're going to dock your ranking. Um, and you're just going to have to sit in the office for the next year. Oh, did you yeah. so, like, imagine. The book that was like, what were you shaming? No, 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 nothing. The, I didn't even mention the company name. It had nothing. It was oh. just the very fact that I had chosen to do something outside the company. And I said to them, I was like, I'm literally the best drilling graduate that you have. And my boss was like, it doesn't matter. What matters is that people see you succeeding outside and they think you mustn't be working hard enough in the company. And I'm like, but uh, the reality is I'm working hard. And they're like, it's the perception is what matters. And so I was like, I don't really, I don't, I don't want to do this. So I took a year leave without pay and I started, you know, doing book tours. In that time, I managed to hustle my way to like, uh, into broadcasting. So I started hosting a national TV show in Australia. Yeah. Um, and then obviously 2017 happened, which was my like, you know. Your Britney uh, year. My, my <laughs> 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 Literally, you know, I got into this um, discussion with a politician uh, on national television about Sharia law. Um, and that kind of lit the fire. Um, and then really from that point on, I was like on the front pages of papers all around Australia. That video went super viral. Um, the Murdoch press started writing, uh, the numbers were something like 200,000 words about me in the space of a year. So context, context yeah. for that, this video that you did about Sharia law, basically you were on some panel show, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happened was is that someone had claimed to be uh, criticizing Sharia law as like some sort of concept that was definable, right? And then you challenged this. Well, she was like, we should ban Muslims. We should ban anything, anybody that follows Sharia. We should just ban them from this country. And I was like, sis, do you even yeah, know yeah. what Sharia law is? Like, do you yeah, know yeah. what it is? Because yeah. people- I mean, do, do we know? Do we know what it is? Do we know? <laughs> I'm kind of like, uh, yeah, it's that thing that we do that kind of tells us what we should do. <laughs> it's not even a law. Like, God damn it. Stuff for the law. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So like, <laughs> as you can see, I get passionate, yeah? And passionate black women with head scars aren't like super television friendly. Yeah. Well, actually we make great television. It's just more that the people don't like us. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this goes viral um, and I become kind of like public enemy number one in Australia. My life blows up. I can't get any work. The prime minister's like, she's a very silly woman. The immigrate, when I lost my job on the broadcaster, the immigration minister said one down, many to go. Um, oh. When I wrote an article about the number of death threats that I get, um, one of the national kind of like Piers Morgan types was like, fair enough, I'd run her over if I saw her. So like things were getting kind of hectic and I moved houses because, um, you know, the death threats. And I found out my neighbor was somebody who was like this alt right guy that really hated me. Um, so like that was awkward. So I just sat at home for a while. I mean, you're, 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 you're kind of laughing it off. I guess it's been a while, right? But like, I don't, I don't feel like it's kind of painted the heaviness of how bad the situation was. Like, it was like, it was like, so basically the, it would be the equivalent of you speaking out at Poppy Day Memorial for people who live in the UK, a time when we're celebrating uh, the lives lost of uh, World War II and World War I. And then you saying that it should be global empathy for lots of different conflicts that are happening, right? And the fight back and the pushback. Also, it's really important to understand Australia is a beautiful country. But like in terms of its kind of cultural diversity and the conversations that are happening, it can be it can be perceived as like a little bit more 
uh, a few sets back as we are here it's in London. There. Australia is incredibly, like incredibly institutionally racist. Australia yeah. still yeah. hasn't Just even- trying to be politically correct. Yeah, no, yeah, no, cool. no. Yeah. Listen, listen, yeah. <laughs> Australia still hasn't un like admitted the fact that it is like invaded a country full of black people. The, the fact, like one university tried to change the word discovered to invaded, and the prime minister yeah. was like, no, 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 that's that you can't say that. We, you can't say that Australia was invaded. Um, yeah. Like there was something called, most people don't know about this, the white Australia policy. You could not migrate to Australia unless you were white until the mid 70s. Yeah, like, crazy. So like the fact that I was one, I'm like, what, 29 now? At the age of like 25, I was one of the first black Muslim women, Muslim women full stop on television, like gives you an indication of how far behind Australia is. Yeah, 100%. And, I mean, even the fact that I posted a couple of days ago that you shouldn't download, like I was like, before you download a, a tracking app from the government, think about whether or not you want the government to track you. The number of people that were like, why don't you trust the government? What is wrong with you? Are you being paranoid? You should not. And I was like, yo, who are all these people who trust the government? Yo. People who are white, yo. Yeah, this is real though. <laughs> this is real because you are, and this is interesting because I used to tease you about this, but you are really anal about like cybersecurity, right? Yeah. And I used to think it, I used to think it was a joke and I used to think like, oh, why is she being so like focused and so, and so zoomed in on this thing? But you've literally had your life targeted Listen. And people like, and surveillance is a big deal. And like, you, yeah. knowing where you are is an issue of life and death when you're like public enemy number one. Let me give you an example. I commented on a Facebook post in the days that I had Facebook. Um, somebody had said something about Sharia and tagged me in it. And I replied being like, I don't think you know what you're talking about, whatever. Like one of these kind of, I was like, okay, tell me what you think then, right? In a kind of like sarcastic tone. One of the journalists from the equivalent of like the Times here in London found that comment and then published on the front page of the Australian that I was getting advice from members of a terrorist group because the person that I was replying to happened to be a member of Hezbo Tahrir, which according to the Australian government is a terrorist group. So they implied that I was a terrorist based off a comment on a Facebook page that I didn't know. I didn't know the guy. I had no idea what was going on. So like the level yeah. that people will go to yeah. to incriminate folks. Do you think yeah. like, do you think I could, and, oh, the best part, one of the funniest parts out of this was the, um, the Council of Imams in Queensland wanted to put out a press release saying, Yasmin Ahmed Majid is not a terrorist. And I was like, guys, don't put out that press release. That is the wrong strategy. Just, just, just for clarification, <laughs> Yasmin Ahmed Majid isn't it? Just in case some of you are wondering, that pink, the pink she wears is dangerous. It was so sweet and well intended. I'm like, this is why we have a PR problem, guys. <laughs> like, yeah. But like, um, yes, yes. But like, uh, oh, sorry, Ali, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what was it like managing that your relationships out while this was all going on? What were your relationships like? Like friends, family? Were they, or would you, yeah. I'm surely like, question. you saw yeah. your friends in colors now, right? What was that like? Good question. And like, look, I have been quite jovial and joking about this, but it's mostly because it's like the most um, awful experience that anyone can ever go through. Like, there are lots of awful experiences, but in terms of like, um, a public, like I was made an, a public example of, I was made an example of, and it was, um, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, right? Yes, and yes, and before you continue that point, can I read out one of the example tweets that you've written, that you've referenced yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, I mean, Yasmin, this is one of your articles and you cite it, but just to give people a, a kind of idea of the level of, of, of uh, violence and hate in the people's tweets. One person wrote, go to Flinders Street Station, cut your wrists and let them bleed out so we can watch, so we can all watch you die. Lest we forget, hopefully I'll be able to distinguish you from all the Sudanese N-word, but I would, but I know you'll be the only ape wearing a ridiculous towel over your head. So I get hundreds of those messages a day. I like, yeah. I went through a point where I literally just didn't check my emails for months. I had an, a, an assistant helping me go through everything and she took a, a mental health day off because she was so traumatized. 
Um, and I guess to your, to your question, Ali, I think it was really tough for all of my relationships. The other thing to point out is that at the time I wasn't living with my family. I was living in a different city. Um, and so I didn't necessarily have my family there and they didn't really know how to deal with it either because from my from my mum's point of view, my mum was like, Yasmina, just stop going on the internet. Just, just stop going on the internet and it'll be fine. And my dad's perspective was like, mm, let's just never mention this. And I think I've had two conversations in two or three conversations with him about it in the year, in the two and a half years since it's all happened. Um, my little brother has literally never mentioned, he like got on the phone once to me that year because my mom put him on the phone. So like my family had no idea how to deal with it. Most of my friends also didn't know how to deal with it. And to be perfectly honest, most of my relationships in Australia have been really, uh, in some ways destroyed or at least really warped by the fact that I went through such a public flogging and people quite often didn't back me. I didn't have that many people standing up and being like, this is unacceptable. I had a few and those people I'm super, super grateful for. Now I understand it's, it's not always easy for people to put themselves on the firing line. And even now, you know, folks who defend me, et cetera, will get kind of hated on. But the fact is I busted my halal rear end you know, for so many people to do all the right things. And most of those people didn't back me. And so I like, there's, there was a great sense of betrayal for me um, to Australia as a country, but also to all of my friends and my professional relationships and my mentors and the people I worked with. I was on boards and councils, people who were at supremely high levels of government and civil society. Those people were silent. Mm -hmm. They were silent. And it taught me a lot about who will stand up for you but also it taught me that most of the time you can't rely on people to no, defend you when, when things hit the fan so ultimately you're feeling isolated you're feeling alone and i think although your case is quite exaggerated i think it's quite a relatable experience for a lot of people and you know what it kind of feels like in a lot of ways i just it just occurred to me it kind of feels like in a really abusive relationship right yeah. Yeah, I mean, I said I said that on a um on a panel show actually. I was like, they were like, "How do you feel about Australia?" I was like, "How do how do you feel about an abusive partner?" Right? Yeah. Like, they gave you a lot of good things, but also yeah. they caused you such trauma. Hundred yeah. percent. Do with that. Actually, hi. Is it okay if I chime in? It's just because I'm getting yeah. a lot of questions now about what you're talking about, and a lot of people really, really want to know how you dealt with that difficult. Like what? <clears throat> well. I mean, so for, for a few months, I thought I could handle it by myself. Um, and then I remember sitting, I went, I was like in a public building of some sort and I went to the toilet and I sat on the loo and I just, I just sat there for 30 minutes. And I was like, oh, I'm so sad. And I don't have the tools to deal with this. I don't have the tools. I just, like, usually I have the tools to fix any problem, but I literally don't know what the tools are. And at that point I picked up the phone and I found a therapist mm -hmm. and I went and started getting therapy. And I think getting therapy and quite frankly, leaving Australia were the two best things for me because that country is still toxic for me now. And it's almost three years later. Right. Yeah. Um, and I needed to create very significant boundaries. Like from a very practical point of view, I deleted Instagram and Twitter and Facebook off my phone and I just didn't check them. I didn't, I like, I just couldn't function if I went in and if people couldn't get a hold of me, it was their problem yeah. because I needed to prioritize my own health. I need, yeah. like my therapist was like, this is the psychological equivalent of you walking into a war zone by yourself. You turn yeah. around and the army isn't there. That's yeah. the psychological equivalent. So I just went into complete survival mode. I moved to London. Now that it was like one of the only people I knew I got an Airbnb and alhamdulillah, I had saved enough money. Alhamdulillah, because I could, because not everyone can do this. But I picked yeah. up, went to a country where I didn't know anyone, where I had like two people I knew. And I sat in my apartment and like bought cryptocurrency for three months and watched that. <laughs> like, that's all I did. I just, I just like went on, went on Reddit forums and learned about crypto, crypto, cryptocurrency. And eventually after three or four months of just, sitting with my sadness 
I slowly, slowly, slowly started to build my life again. But it takes it takes a long time. And right. I've never been the same person. But like, you know, like any abusive relationship, whether it's between an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend, there's like an irrational love that you can't quite fathom or quantify because through all the trauma and the abuse, there are still moments of like, yeah, moments that might have made you feel whole or moments that made you feel like worthy or loved in your weird warped way of what it means to be loved. Mm. Um, and I like a lot of past relationships to make it relatable for, for most of us. There are moments in which we feel like we want to go back, mm. right? Uh, to tap back into that love that we once lost. Were there moments for you in this abusive relationship in Australia that you felt like you needed to tap back into what it meant to be an Australian again because you came to London and you pushed it aside? Were there moments where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna go back to Australia and I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue this fight? It's interesting. I mean, what, what, what was that like when you when you arrived in Australia after some time in London? What was that feeling even like? I am not at the point yet that I could even consider going back. Like. I, I think it's it's like such heartbreak because I, I genuinely loved Australia. I loved, I loved, I traveled around the whole country. I saw so many parts of it. I like, you know, I, sw I like swum in the oceans and I traveled across the deserts and, you know, there is nothing like the Australian landscape. I have such love for the indigenous people and the stories and the, the like larrikin-ness of it all and the, like all of that I love, but I think the bit that really hurts is that I was vulnerable and exposed. And it's like, it's like it's speaking of, you know, that relationship when you're in a relationship with someone and you open your heart to them and they spit in your face. It's so jarring and it's so painful. And to be honest, it took me a long time to trust anything in anyone. Like Ali was one of my first like new friends here and he'll tell you how long it took before I was like, you know, kind of a soft person again. I used to get, I used to be so brittle mm. because, because my tolerance for, for anything was so low. I don't really, like, I think for me what it's, the one thing I can compare it to is the feeling that, you know, all the stories that we have of parents that have left countries that have betrayed them in some way, right? Mm. Um, and this really kind of mixed relationship they have with, with wherever they're from. I have that in a sense to Australia. But the thing that complicates it further is Australia is not, Australia is a settler colony. It's a colony still. I don't actually yeah. have the right to Australia. Australia yeah. belongs to First Nations people. So how could I possibly claim the right to that? That's really interesting well, though, isn't it? Something home that isn't even a home to the people living there originally. Exactly. And if I'm someone committed to decolonizing, if I'm someone committed to, you know, challenging and dismantling white supremacy, how can I participate in that willingly? Mm -hmm. Snaps to that, snaps to that. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, that's, yeah. So it's not even like you're not leaving something that belongs to you because it never belongs to you in the first place. Exactly. Like if I, if I grew up in a stolen house, what right do I have to you know, the memories of that house. What right do I have to reclaim it? Yeah, 100%. You know what, like, I, I get this a lot from speaking to friends of mine, especially ones who have, like, a deep sense of, like, rootedness in what mm -hmm. their idea of home is. And, like, when I hear them talking about home and what it means to them, I even in London, as amazing as London is, like, there is no emotional, like, attachment here on that level. Like, for mm -hmm. example, I have, like, Palestinian friends, but there's a deep-rooted attachment to their mm -hmm. homeland. A lot of it's rooted in, like, resistance and trauma and, like, um, stolen lands. But, like, because here, we're just kind of been plotted here and we, we don't have that historical attachment here, I don't feel like, yo, yeah. if I was to pick up my bags and move to New York, it would be such a big deal. I, I feel like I don't, I don't have a home, but I have many roots, you yeah. know, and which means that I have the blessing of being able to make many places my home. Um, but I couldn't, like, I love London. I like, I mean, with its terrible weather and grumpy people, you know, <laughs> mm. I think I found, I found salvation here. Um, yeah. And I think it's also, it's different for someone like me who's moved here as an adult of their own choice versus people yeah. that have grown up here. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't understand the class system. I don't have a, I didn't go to a particular type of school, a particular type of university. So it doesn't matter to me, but yeah. it matters a lot if you grew up here. So there are all these other things that I'm like, that I get to, I have an immigrant privilege here 
that my fellow, you know, POC who are the same age, this fellow diaspora third culture kids who grew up here don't have. And so I'm very yeah. like cognizant of that. So like, like, it's like, so yes, you've had, you, you, you know, you had the fortune and the luxury of coming to London and starting your life again, right? Um, when was the turning point where you started to feel less brittle and more emancipated and free? Like what, can you trick, can you pinpoint that to a relationship or a moment? Or was it, was it suddenly sitting down at a dinner table and you had friends that you probably never would have made in the real world? How did life change from what it was to what it is now? So... Oli is part of a very special group of friends here for me in London. Um, wow, cool. Speak. Yeah, no, don't worry. Yeah, I hope you two. Uh, <laughs> you two. Yeah. yeah. No, you, can sign out now. you can sign out. We're done. That's cool. cool. No, don't worry about it. You guys, you guys have fun. Yeah. Sorry, you're saying. <laughs> so, when I, so when I started like emerging back into the world, I, um, I, I signed up to this co-working space near me. And through, and I literally sat at this cafe every single day for like four months and just chatted to anyone who would bear to listen. Um, and Ali was one of these people and a couple of other people there as well. And I think there was, there was a particular day and I wrote it down in like my little journal. There was a day I had a day of chatting with like Ali and Lloyd and Joy and a couple of others, Natalie. Hey. And... <laughs> And then I think we had a little bit, of, a little bit of a dance. And then I, I walked out of the co-working space and I started chatting with some people who were smoking some shisha. And then I walked down a little further and I started chatting in Arabic to the guy at the kebab shop and I bought the most delicious kebab. And like, by the time I got home, it was a 10 minute walk, but the walk took me hours, you know? And I was like, oh my God, I have friends. I have people that know me here. Oh, I, I felt like I belonged. And it was only, it was a few months. It was like April, maybe 2009, 2018. And it was the first time where I was like, oh, people know me here and they care about me. And that means something. Mm-hmm. And that, that tiny little building block is all that I needed to start building again. And, you know, the storm, I, the storm, all, all, it, all it has meant is that, yes, those waves of grief and trauma, they continue, but they're, the, the waves are further apart and I can see them coming, yeah. right? And I can prepare myself for them a little yeah. bit. I think it's just really powerful that like people were the cause of so much pain for you, but also people were the cause of so much love for you at the same time. Mm-hmm. And they brought you back. And I think like, I mean, I remember, I remember seeing with you and, 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 and seeing that genesis and that, that kind of journey. And um, do you feel like the Yasmin of Australia and the Yasmin of London are two different people? Oh, completely. I mean, if, if Yasmin of 2016 had, had seen Yasmin of 2020, she'd be like, who is this sis? Like, <laughs> how, did they, how did this person come about? But I think it was it was funny. I did a, a talk recently, and somebody asked me if um, if I would change anything or if I would tell anything to my younger self. And it reminded me of a conversation that I had, one of the few conversations I had face to face with my mum about all of this. And she said to me, she was like, "Yasmina, should we have prepared you differently? Should we have told you how hard the world was going to be? Have we failed you by not preparing you?" And I mean, the, the, the question broke my heart because she, because she then asked, should we have come to Australia at all? Because this would never have happened in Sudan. Man, that's heavy. That is heavy. And, and what do you do when, when the place that you run to for safety is, is maybe not the salvation you thought it was going to be? I, I said to my mom, I was like, you can never question the decision you made. And I would never want that for you. Like this is, this is a path Allah has laid for me, right? And I had to go through this person, I had to go through this process to become the person that I am today. Like I would not have been able to be the person I am today without going through that. Um, but I, so I read Yasmin's story, my first book, and it happened before all of that. And there is such an innocence and sweetness to her that I'm okay, I'm okay mm-hmm. with that. I'm okay with 23, 24 year old Yasmina being bright eyed and bushy tailed and being like, yes, all you have to do is work hard and everything will be fine. 
it's okay for her to have that idealistic, naive belief because the world will come crashing down, but she has to learn that for herself. Yeah. You know, so is that is that your kind of like call to action for young people thinking of being very public in 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 the realms that you operate in? Is that at first you're gonna begin very googly eyed, but like be prepared. It's all gonna come raining down, and you need to be prepared for that. Some so sometimes I give like the doom and gloom message. I'm like, yo, system, it's gonna eat you up and chew you out. You've got no chance against the hierarchy of patriarchy, white supremacy, and the post-colonial. No. Right. So sometimes when I'm in that mood, that's how I go. Right. Yeah. But also sometimes I'm like the ideal, the idealism of youth is what we need. Right. Like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all of these lads were so young when they did their activism. John Lewis, one of you know the, the civil rights leaders, he was like a student in his early 20s. And so mm. I also think there is, there's such value in letting the youth have their naive optimism and letting them go on their own journeys. And But our job as people who've been through it is to catch them when they fall. Because mm. I had to fall, I had to go through it, but nobody was there to catch me. Yeah. That's super powerful. The idealism of youth is a beautiful. You're just coming out with little nuggets today. You are <laughs> fasting as well. I don't know how you're doing it. Well, what I did want to say, yes, is because in the interest of time, mm -hmm. there was a really in, there was a really interesting connection with this idea of um, you cannot really leave somewhere that was never really yours. Mm. Um, and as someone of Sudanese background of of cultural heritage, um. Um, I wondered whether like what your relationship with one Sudan is, but Sudan has gone through something quite cataclysmic as well at the same time. And what was your relationship with that whole, um, um, that whole uh, issue that was going on in Sudan with the revolution? Like, was there a, was there a feeling of, you know what, like I, I, I have many roots and Sudan is one of them. And this is something that I need to be involved in on a more deeper level, or was it very different for you? I was so invested in the revolution. I mean, I would, wake up every day and go to sleep every day thinking about it tweeting about it writing about it d d debating whether or not i should go like i wanted to i almost booked so many times to go to sudan part of the challenge is my family in sudan didn't want me to be there because they didn't want me to die like one of my cousins unfortunately was killed in the protests oh, I'm sorry um, to that. Thank you. Well, and so for them, it's very real, right? For them, they know that I'm the firebrand. They know that I'm going to get involved. They know that I'm going to put myself in the line of fire. And they didn't want that. And, and I think there was this tension between it being a political thing for me, but for them, it was their life. It wasn't just an, like a sort of um, a theoretical conversation about government. It wasn't just like a battle of mm. ideas. It was literally, you might die. And if and if you die and none of us can pay for food, what are we gonna do? Like, it's a, it's a much, the, the, the level of conversation is quite different. I uh. have such a conflicted relationship with Sudan. I, after I graduated university, I went and, and lived with my grandmother there for about half a year to, you know, as my grandma said, no one was gonna marry me if I couldn't cook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you still can't, but you managed, you managed to get that one done. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, so also sidebar, my husband loves to cook and my aunties in Sudan think it's an outrage. They send me so many scolding voice notes being like, what is, what are you doing? You need to respect yourself, woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, like a, uh, give yourself some credit, okay? Remember the first dinner? Remember the first time we went out for dinner? Uh, there was spoon. There was no spoons. <laughs> <laughs> the shame. Oh wow, you really, yeah, some embarrassing moments being brought up here. I think, but the other thing, Nanda, I'll say that's really important to recognize is that I also don't have a tribe, right? So because my family is of such mixed heritage. Um, we don't have a technical Sudanese tribe, which means that even in the Sudanese context, I'm a second class citizen. I'm considered what's called Moalid or Sudanese by birth, not by tribe. And oh, wow, that's so interesting. It's, I mean, it's deep because it means that even my cousins that live there and have grown up there, they're not considered as Sudanese as the people, you know, who might be next door, even though all of their culture is just as Sudanese. And so yeah. in all of the places that I've lived and all the places I have roots to, I don't have any 
undeniable rights to belong. Yeah. And I guess what it's meant it's is that like perhaps belonging perhaps I depend less on external validation to decide when I belong. And I choose for myself the places that I want to belong to. Do you have an example of that? London. Yeah. Correct? I could have picked anywhere in the world, really. I could have literally, like, I mean, visas pending, but like I could have moved anywhere. Um, right. But I chose to belong to London and I chose to call myself a Londoner because I was like, this is a place where I would be proud to belong to. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. But the thing is, right, and I the reason why I kind of initially brought that up in the first place is that I think I always, I, being of mixed heritage myself, mm. but being born and raised in London, I always question myself, like, how involved can I be with, for example, mm. let's, uh, Pakistan and the partition, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's also conversations about the renaissance of the, the, the narratives around the, the around the partition and how how involved can I be in that conversation, really having quite a limited access to that part of the world, even though it, 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 it undeniably, you know, makes the fabric of who I am as a child of diaspora, as someone who's part Pakistani, do I have claim to claim this history and this and this culture and this heritage as my own as fully as someone who's fully Pakistani who's mm -hmm. who's claimed it? And I guess Ali in some way, I don't know yeah. whether you relate to that as yeah, someone no, who also is Pakistani. Totally, 100%. It's, it's like more so with Pakistani because it's interesting that like whenever, whenever I'm around family, we'll discuss like partition and it's always like I'll just be the one listening as opposed to people ever being like oh what's your experience as a Pakistani mm. but funnily enough then when it comes to the issue of being like talking about blackness it's like oh what's your we want to know like we want to know straight from you talk about blackness to us whatever you say is like go gold and it's like talk to me also like asking my opinion as a, as a Pakistani here living you know yeah and, 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 and I guess like I guess the question, for, I guess the question that kind of alludes to for me is that during the Sudanese Revolution, did you feel comfortable being someone quite outspoken about the Sudanese um, uh, Revolution as opposed so, to someone else in Sudan who who yeah, could have been saying no, it? It's a very, very relevant question, and I think it is always important in this context when you're sort of someone like me who's grown up outside but speaking about something connected to your sort of heritage, and to be humble, right? And I would, I would always. You know, whenever I was asked to write about it, I was I would ask if they wanted to to hear from somebody who was on the ground, or I would do my very best to amplify voices that were on the ground. Because the reality is, I'm not on the ground. The reality is, I have a different. You know, my skin is not in the game in the same way that my cousins are, or my aunties, or my family there. And so I I, I cannot claim the same level of legitimacy as a full Sudanese. Like that's just true. What I can claim is heritage link to it i can claim an interest to it i can claim a passion to it i can also do my very best to take all of the experiences and the the gifts and the privileges that allah's bestowed me with alhamdulillah outside to benefit those who are there but it is not my like it's not my place to go back and fix that's not my place yeah. it never yeah. will be it's almost you know? like a privilege right that we living here we're kind of disconnected from that where we can kind of play an activist role for it but like you said like for your family back home in Sudan it was literally life and death for them they right. kind of have the privilege of you know like organizing or like you know being activists for it we have that we can sit back take our time organize people to come together and help and let's not let's not get that twisted right let's remember our place I think yeah. it's totally it's totally okay to be passionate in fact go for it but just remember and I think it's like it doesn't make it any less worthy. I think sometimes we think that maybe it's less worthy. It just is what it is. Yeah, I think I've, from like, like I totally agree with that. And I think I've kind of learned throughout through my multi, my multi multicultural heritage that like just because you're part of something doesn't make mean you can't feel fully it, right? Like there are times where like I feel a hundred percent Pakistani. There are times I feel a hundred percent Indonesian, a hundred percent Yemeni, whatever, right? Um, and I think like what's interesting about your story is that a lot of us in our kind of identity crisis are scrambling, trying to find a sense of rootedness. But actually your story is really interesting because like you have decided where you want to plant those roots. You need As opposed to, to us claiming, yeah. trying to reclaim, trying to reclaim something that once was, you've been like, you know what? This is an active conscious decision of what I want my roots to be. And they're here now. You need to give yourself permission. Like 
I think that is one of the things that this whole process has taught me is you need to give yeah. yourself permission to, to be whatever it is that you feel connected with to, I suppose, allow yourself, like, I don't, you I, also, I'm sorry, so no. I was gonna say, you also think it's time as well. Like, unfortunately, because of like how quickly the whole Australia thing happened for you, you didn't really have the time to kind of figure out, okay, where am I in all in my life? You kind of, okay, Australia happened, let's go but to, like, to London, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And only now, once you settle down, it's almost like, okay, cool. Where is hope? Like, where can I call my own now? Mm. Right? I guess, yeah. I think time is com is one of one of the most bits useful bits of advice that I got through all of 2017 and my process here was that the one thing that's guaranteed is that time will pass mm. and whatever it is that you're going through it will be over at some point you don't know when that time will come but it will come and so I think also taking taking a sort of a breath when things are feeling really hype and manic sometimes and when it does feel like you're in this fight or flight space which so many of us whether it's at a national level or just in our families when you feel intensely and you feel it in your body mm. you feel it in in your gut like my gut like too much information maybe but like the amount of things that I'm intolerant to now because of the amount of stress that I went through and the change in my gut because of it I can barely handle chili, you guys. This is a problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's deeply so, embarrassing. <laughs> so before we go, before we go in Q and A, because time has flown. Um, you know, for a lot of our community and a lot of people watching this, a lot of them are aspirational creatives or people who who are really passionate about uh, sharing their voice um, uh, in any creative outlet. For you and from your experience um, on both sides of, of, of witnessing and experiencing it as an extremely positive thing and on the flip side as something actually quite traumatic, what would you recommend for a young creative who has a passion to share their voice to either be prepared for or to take with them in their future? You need to decide what success looks like for you. And it cannot look like what other people think of it. Because if you start to define your success, your happiness, your sadness, your value based on other people's opinions, you will never be happy or satisfied because people are fickle. They are so fickle. They will turn on a dime. So de decide for yourself what success looks like. Maybe it looks like just making the film. Maybe it looks like publishing a book. Maybe it looks like a blogging every day for 30 days in a row. Whatever it is, decide for yourself what that looks like and focus on what you can control because there is so much that you can't. Most yeah. things in life you can't, but focus on what you can control. Like perfect that craft, work on that craft. And then when you put it out, you know, maybe nobody reads it. Maybe a million people read it. But if you're proud of the work that you've done, that's all that will be enough. Amazing. Thank you so much, Yas. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to Hanan and some Q&As. We've got some people here in the Zoom. Um, Hanan, is there any questions that you think you'd like to ask Yas? Hi, Yasmin. Hi, hey. everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. We got a lot of questions for you today let's see if we can get through some of them i'm sorry guys if we don't get to go through all of them we'll do our best um so someone asked um about i guess the the strategy that well-intended people wanted to use i guess you were talking about the people in queensland who uh, mm -hmm. Like to say, Yasmin isn't a terrorist. So um, this person asked, can you elaborate on how we can create better counter narratives that don't put us on the defensive? Mm. I think what's really interesting about all the narratives to do with, you know, securitization and terrorism and so on in relation to Muslims <clears throat> is that we never decide the framework of that conversation or the boundaries of that conversation. So the trick is once you engage with them on their own terms, you lose, right? If you say, Yasmin is a terrorist and your response is Yasmin is not a terrorist, people are just gonna hear the words Yasmin and terrorist and associate them, right? And so the trick is how do you reframe the debate completely? Say Yasmin is a terrorist, the, the, the press release you put is um, Yasmin Abdel Majid has started Youth Without Borders at the age of 16 and is celebrating you know, the third year of the Spark Engineering Camp and we're really excited to give her $10,000 for this. 
right? And then all of a sudden, you've completely changed the conversation, right? This woman talking about Sharia law, I'm sorry, this woman talking about banning Muslims. Did I talk about banning Muslims? I didn't even mention the word banning Muslims. No, I said, do you know what Sharia law is? Because fundamentally the argument is flawed. So you have to find the way to completely deflate that poof of falsehood so that you can actually start having the conversation that you want to be having. That was a great answer. I think a lot of us need to hear that as well because you know we tend to use we tend to fight in the boxes that people draw for us. So what you're saying is kind of redraw the box a little bit. And hundred percent. Yeah, and there's another question as well from somebody uh, who asked, "What can non-Muslim women do to support Muslim women and women of color in predominantly white environments?" Great question. I think there's there's lots of. Um, work out their articles and so on around the concepts of allyship and so on. I think the important thing to think about is in those spaces, you have a lot of weight, right? You have, think of yourself as like, you know, you're all in a room and you're all like round balls of different size, right? And some of these balls are made of gold and lead and are really heavy. And some of these balls are just full of gas and they're floating about and they don't have any control or power because because of, of, the, of the amount of weight or power they have in that society. So if you're a white person in a predominantly white space, you have a lot of weight, be careful with that weight and use that weight with purpose. So if you see somebody throwing their weight around, right, and somehow disrupting your POC friend or, or colleague, or Muslim colleague, rather than asking them, hey, do you want me to do this on behalf of you? No, that's energy that they don't wanna be expending, right? You use your power and deal with that situation, you know, white person to white person, you sort your people out. And then that gives other people the space to start being able to sort of, you know, settle in on their own terms. Great advice and I hope people found that helpful. Uh, well, I think we still have time some, uh, for another question. Uh, one question that someone asked, well, a few people actually asked about this because I think a lot of people can see that you've been through some really devastating and traumatic times and they are also kind of maybe going through similar or maybe you know can feel can relate to that on some level so some people are asking what advice you have for people to rebuild themselves after a traumatic event hmm. i think so from a spiritual point of view there was a couple of things that kept me going through you know the trauma something that we've probably all heard before which is this idea that allah never gives us more than we can handle. So I always, the two thoughts that often stayed in my mind throughout it all was, A, Allah never gives me more than I can handle. So somehow, somewhere I can handle this. I just need to become the person that is handling it, right? And also that in every trauma, I can learn something, but it is okay for me just to sit in the feels. And I had to give myself permission just to feel how I felt at that time and to not place any pressure on myself to perform a particular way. I always used to say, oh, I should be fixed. Oh, I should be better. Oh, I should stop crying. And my therapist was like, should for who? Who, why? Why do we have all these ideas of what we should be rather than just sitting with who we are in that moment? So giving yourself permission to just be in that moment, sit with whatever it is and allow it to pass in its own time will hopefully give you a lot more agency and control over how you move through the world and how you get through this time, inshallah. Well, thank you for that. Actually, related to that, somebody also asked, what, how much of a role do you think therapy played in you finding yourself again? I think therapy for me played a very important role in that particular time. I don't still, I, like I stopped seeing my therapist not so long ago. And I think, you know, my relationship with my therapist is about them giving me tools to get through a particular point in time. And once I have those tools, I can now rely on myself. If I'm in a situation where I need tools again, say for example, um, and I, I'm sure he won't mind sharing, but my partner and I, before we got married, we were like, okay, let's go talk to a couples therapist because we need to go into this prepared. There were no issues, but it was about us preparing ourselves and arming ourselves with the right tools for marriage. And I think for me, that's how I think about therapy. It's about how do I give myself the tools so that I can best go through this experience. 
Yeah, it's just a way to kind of fill up your toolbox and cope with different things in your life. Exactly. I'm an engineer. I love all the tools, yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Do, do you think we have time for another question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Okay, so another question we have is, was the person who you changed to become a conscious choice? Uh, they just want to know kind of the thought process between mm -hmm. and who you are today. I'm not, I'm not sure that I consciously decided that I would be a particular type of person, but certainly I took a number of lessons from my experience and that informs the, what it did was it clarified to me the kind of person I want to be, right? It clarified to me that I would much rather be true to my principles than be liked by people, you know? that my faith was really important to me, but my faith was something between me and Allah, not between me and all the Muslims, right? That hierarchies of oppression was something that needed to be dismantled structurally and systemically. And that, you know, me being the, the like perfect good Muslim was never going to fix that. So there were a number of kind of principles and values that came out of that experience that I, that I now know are important to me. And I think maybe before I didn't quite know what was important to me just yet. Right. Okay, I think, I mean, just to be mindful of time, I think it might be time for us to wrap up this caravansara. Usually my role in this is to kind of uh, give a little bit of a summary of what was said, uh, kind of key takeaways, because I guess in the traditional caravansara, travelers would enter the inn and leave with more stories or different ideas to take along with them on their journeys. and. Definitely, you've left us with a lot of a lot of things to think about because I mean that was an amazing story. Uh, I don't think many of us uh, can really appreciate fully exactly what you went through in those times from being, I guess, the second in the second Sudanese family in Brisbane to I don't know having a breakup with your country and finding a new home in London, to finding new roots in London. Like that's amazing story. And I guess some takeaways for me were I guess. Number one, maybe not even what you said, but how you say things, just your confidence and kind of incontrovertible sense of humor through things, this kind of being unapologetically yourself and unapologet unapologetically positive about how you, how you face situations and how you just keep going. That for me is something that I will take away from just watching you speak, just how you are and who you are. So that's definitely a takeaway for me. And another thing I guess more conceptually would be understanding belonging in home, what it means to belong in a place. I mean, you said so many things there, which you know I think a lot of people can relate to, like how you can't, um, I think how you don't have a home, but you have many roots. And I think a lot of people, children of diaspora have that sense of, you know, I, I don't really belong in this stolen house, but you know, I have roots in many places and how you've also connected to people and found home in people mm. and uh, in friendships. I think that was really powerful as well. And I guess in terms of trauma as well, uh, how you said to be there for other people, to be there for the younger generation, like the coming from someone who wasn't, supported who felt betrayed in that heartbreaking situation um, to kind of be there for the people who have this youthful idealism and when they fall to just catch them and be there for them to be the support that the generation after us needs I think that's a really powerful thing as well and one kind of thing that I picked up from everything that you said was choice uh, because in everything that you've said you've also in every space that you've inhabited it seems like what you've recognized is something that you can, can, can control is that you do have a choice to define things in your life mm -hmm. you have the choice to define who you are how to claim your space how to be the person you need to be in an oil rig to be like unapologetically yourself in a male dominated white dominated space you you defined that space for yourself and you defined also where you belong and you've also taught us how to define what success means to us. Mm -hmm. So it's like claiming your ability to choose, claiming what's in your control. I found that really powerful as well. And that's something I'm going to take with me outside of this caravan. Sarai. So thank you so much, Yasmin, for all of that today. Really appreciate it. Yo, uh, yeah. clicky, oh, clicky fingers. Click, clicky clicky oh, fingers wow. to Yasmin. Thank you so much. Uh, no, yes, I really appreciate it. You know how, you know how much I value you. And think highly of you it's just amazing to kind of unleash you onto a community of people that mean a lot to me so thank you so much for coming honestly thank you and ramadan kareem everyone right now we're going to leave you we're going to leave you on a on a little question i oh. need you to imagine i need to imagine there's a burning building right mm. it's the blazing inferno of death okay 
Now on the roof of this building is yourself, me, and Ali. All right? Wow. And you can only save one person from this burning inferno. Bro, I'm running into the building. All I'm gonna <laughs> say, <laughs> all, 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 all I'm right, say so is- So let's just settle this now, all right? Let's just settle this now. When you need Because a, you I need to know. know, I need to know. <laughs> You're, yes, well, hold on Ali, all right, hold on. Can I mute? I'm gonna mute this guy, muted. All right, there we go, all right? Yes, we're even matching. This is deliberate. You think this was a mistake? Flat white. You think, you think I'm just wear pink on a daily basis? Huh? This was totally deliberate. There for you, huh? Yasmin leaves the chat. <laughs> right. We'll we'll leave it on that cliffhanger. We'll let we'll let the crowd decide. But choices. You know how we do. You know how we do. Thank you so much, everyone. So yeah, I love you lots, man. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you. Thanks. Um, thanks everyone for joining in for another episode. Um, we had an amazing time. Ali, how do you feel about that? That was great. Um, she's amazing. I love her even more than I already do. Um, yeah, amazing woman. Amazing. I'm so liberal. Yeah, yay. And it, of course, would not be possible without all of you turning up. We really appreciate it. We're learning a lot. We're kind of doing this just to kind of, you know, have casual conversations and extrapolate some deep and meaningful things that might stay with us. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you need some feedback or you want to provide us some thoughts, we would love to hear it. I hope you join us next week. Now, next week is going to be a bit of a crazy one. So plot it in your diaries from now. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. It's really exciting. Some names that you might be familiar with. Um, and I think you're going to have a great time. So make sure you kind of schedule that in your diaries. We love you a lot. Hannah, thank you so much for a banging conclusion. I'm going to put it on grid view now. I want everyone to click your fingers and show some love and do that little cute Korean thing that they do, you know, when they go, oh, gambate, all that kind of, yeah, that sort of, yeah, cool. <laughs> you guys, you guys are losers. Really embarrassing. I don't know these people. I don't know these people. See you later, guys. <laughs>